good morning, afternoon, or night to everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, this is the question and answer session for the Ecological Niche Modeling 2020 course. Uh, I believe it's week 13. And we have actually six of the instructors with you. Um, Mona Papage, Daniel Nosgaard, uh, Marlon Cobos, Jamie Cass, Jorge Soberon, and me. Uh, so we're going to pretty much directly jump into questions. Uh, just want to orient you quickly as to where we are in this course. Let's see. There we go. Week 13. Would be nice if it would scroll all the way down. Okay, there we are. And guess what? This is the last week of occurrence data. And next week, we will jump into visualization. And that will be with talks from uh, Luis Escobar and Hui Jie Chow. So we're going to start into kind of looking at the, the occurrence data and the environmental data that we've been uh, talking about the last few weeks. OK, into questions. Um, instructors, and particularly Jamie and Daniel, where would you like to start? I started at the top and was trying to answer as many as I could, but I only got maybe 10 or so, or maybe less than that down, but. Um, yeah, and I've only got about 10, um, <laughs> but I think I made it through all of them. Okay, you don't have to answer all of them. Um, that's what happens when we have hundreds of questions. Rather, just pick out whichever ones are most interesting or most salient or most fun, whatever you would like to answer. Yeah, I'm gonna do my best with, with answering questions. Um, maybe not by today, but I, I did encounter an interesting one on how to um, partition or subset data for invasive species modeling. Do you have a line number? Yeah, it is, oh boy. I think I may have seen um, it. 1791. Yep, see I already highlighted it as well. So yeah. my question is regarding the best method for evaluating invasive species distribution models. Is that different from native species or can we have an evaluation method specifically for invasive species? Regards. Go for it, Jamie. Yeah, so I, I already wrote an answer. Um, it's not, you know, complete obviously, but uh, what I was saying was, I think in most cases, you want to include um, occurrence data from both the native and invaded ranges. And so uh, if you do that, you can use any of the ways that I, I discussed in order to partition data. But an interesting one would be maybe if you, if you partition by region. So maybe the native range is one region um, and all the invaded ranges are other regions. Um, the, the partitioning that way and um, looking at the evaluation would give you um, uh, kind of a, a different answer than maybe partitioning randomly. Um, so if the, if the model performs poorly, that would mean that each of the regions has a different environmental signature. Um, especially, uh, you'd be most interested, I think, uh, in if uh, the invaded ranges can predict the native range or if a particular invaded range might, uh, 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 you know, evaluate, might uh, perform poorly if, if uh, you train the model on everything but that range. So um, I think of most interest is maybe the, the native range. So can all the invaded ranges predict the native range is particularly interesting. Um, However, this is, this is not uh, you know, necessarily more useful than partitioning any, any other way. It would just give you a different answer. So it depends on what your question is, obviously. Uh, but with an inv invasive species, you have uh, maybe a few more interesting options for partitioning. Very much so. Um, I'll throw in a comment, which is 
you know, one of the kind of old bits of wisdom or old ideas has always been that, well, species invasions aren't very predictable because not necessarily the, the ecological niche signature is different, but rather because the, uh, the biotic element and the, and, you know, we talk about ecological release and things like that. Um, and so you might have the same, um, the same fundamental niche, but against different biotic backgrounds. And so this partitioning by region that Jamie suggests, I agree with it completely, um, this partitioning by regions would get at that question, whether the, the biotic context is, um, is having kind of pervasive effects on the niche signature in any one of those regions. And the other comment I'd throw out is that many of the invasive species that we end up uh, analyzing are things that are of concern because they're already invasive somewhere else in the world. So if you're in South America and there's a new invader, um, that new invader most likely got recognized or is of concern because somewhere else, maybe in Asia or in Australia or wherever, it's already been a really nasty invasive. And so that sets you up to use that regional partitioning very powerfully. Because if, let's say, let's say it's on three continents and you're on the fourth continent, well, you could use a regional subsetting of the three continents, essentially using each pair to predict the third, and that's going to give you a really nice view of how well using all three of them is going to be able to predict the fourth, which is why you're doing the study. Right, and and so uh, particularly for invasive species, this is this is uh, relevant. But you you could have um, some kind of biotic uh, uh, um, effect preventing the species from occupying areas that are within its fundamental niche. Um, within the native range, and when it, it invades a new region, uh, that biotic element is missing, and so it can occupy other parts. And so, just because the model is performing poorly, just because um, one region cannot predict another, does not necessarily mean it's environmentally different. Um, it, you know, it could be because of biotic reasons too. And this applies for uh, within the native range as well. There might be regions that are missing a certain predator even within the native range, or so on and so forth. More comments or a different question? Just, I just wanted to add that uh, working with invasive species is always difficult because like many things, not only how to partition data, but the, the initial assumptions as well. Like, uh, and the fact that our modeling techniques do not reconstruct the fundamental niche because we cannot do it with the data we have, at least with correlative models. So, uh, it's risky as well that with invasive species, it's difficult to uh, identify a good like, calibration area for those invasive records because the time that the species has had in that area probably did not allow the species to explore enough environments. So we can say, okay, that's the, a limit or it doesn't have a limit there. And if we, create different areas for background there, we're going to, do, we're going to probably artificially be uh, including environments that the species is not using that are different to the native areas, but that probably are not the limit either. It's just that the species hasn't had the chance to go there yet. So consider all that when you're working with invasive species, it's complicated. Just try to be aware of the initial assumptions you're doing and what are the risks. Yeah, we're, we're gonna come back to the idea of calibration areas and accessible areas. But yeah, you know, working on a species that is out of distributional or that is not yet in distributional equilibrium is very challenging. And my feeling is that we can often 
um, get to the wrong answers because of that. I have a, um, a question here, down 1839. 1839? Yeah. That's about what is background um, data. It's, it's a good question because in my view, it's often background is confused with pseudo absences. And uh, it's good to, to, to make the distinction, I think. Uh, the background, when you are training a model using certain algorithms, for instance, Maxent, which is a very popular one, uh, Maxent does a comparison between the distribution of environments in the observations to some other distribution of environments. And that comes from the background. So what Maxent does is take 10,000 by default, or you can you can tweak that number. 10,000 uh, random uh, points from the area that you, again, often by default, the area that you define to be the background. So Maxent is going to compare the distribution of environments in your samples again the distribution of environments in that background which is a random sample of whatever area you define that's what is background uh, not every software needs background data to to, to be fitted but maxent does and others too um, is not the same as pseudo absences although often in the literature you will see that both are equated because when you uh, pseudo absences are required for other types of, of, of methods like for instance any regression based method would prefer to have zeros and ones presences and absences and you, you don't have data for the absence maybe you can generate it in some reasonable way and produce a string of zeros that will be used for absences in a regression type algorithm but for Maxent is not really, the meaning is not hypothetical or real zeros. The meaning is something to compare the observations to. And that's what, what it means. I hope this uh, helps the person that asked this question. So it's worth noting that, you know, if you're using one of those algorithms that wants absence data, so, you know, here are some presences and here are some absences and how are they different environmentally? You may have absence data and that could be very powerful, mm -hmm. but you have to think very carefully about why the absence data are absence data. If we go back to BAM diagram reasoning, <clears throat> the only presences that are meaningful and I would say the only absences that are meaningful are within M, which is to say they're within the area that has been accessible to the species. Because those are the, those are the places where if the species is not present, it's not, not present because it has never been there. So as far as we know, our version of life has never been off planet with a couple minor exceptions. Um, so the absence of a hyacinthine macaw from Mars does not tell us anything about whether Martian environments would be good for hyacinthine macaws. Um, and those questions become much more relevant on kind of medium to small scales. You know, is it on that? Other, is it not on that other mountain because it doesn't like that other mountain, or because because it's never gotten there? So that's one thing that you have to think about the BAM diagram. But then you also have to think about even in an accessible site, why was the species not registered there? Has the site ever been sampled? Has the site been sampled enough? If the site was sampled enough, are the reports shared openly such that you would know about it? 
So, you know, absence data are very simply a two-edged sword. They could be very, very powerful because they provide an explicit contrast to the presence data, but they can also be very, very deceptive. Any other comments on absence versus pseudo-absence data? I had signaled a question that I thought was particularly interesting. Uh, is it better to use geographic or environmental subsetting? <laughs> and this is this is a you know the sort of question that comes up, and it's it's a good question, but I think it has a very clear answer. Also, let's imagine we have. Some, in, some environmental range and some occupied range. Well, if we want to subset our data by environments, well, that's going to reduce the representation of environments in whatever subset we use to calibrate our models. And so we're going to create a bias that is going to under characterize the ecological niche. So I think there's a very clear answer that you cannot use environmental subsetting in ecological niche modeling unless it was some very fine checkerboard sort of thing. But I think, I think it has to be a spatial subsetting or you're in very, very dangerous territory of creating the biases that we always set out to avoid. But that's a question that I've I've seen come up many times. Um, we we wrestled with that in our 2011 book. Um, I've seen that question come up over and over again, and you know again it, it it's the sort of thing that has a very clear answer at least to me. So can I chime in a little bit? Of course. Um, so I guess a spatial block in a way is kind of like a, a, an environmental subset in a way. You're, 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 um, you're partitioning by geography, but if the blocks are very big, you're representing very large regions. And if it's spatial and the, re and the regions are, are in different parts of space, then you're probably characterizing different environments to some extent. Um, in, uh, you know, Partitioning like this is forcing the model to extrapolate. And in, in, in the, the lecture, I said, you know, basically you need to think about what your which, what your research aims are. Are you trying? Uh, uh, eventually, will you use this model to make extrapolations into environmental space, into uh, ranges of the environment that you have not considered in, in model training? Um, if so, you might be interested to know whether or not the particular model settings you chose um, accurately. Uh, to some extent, uh, can make extrapolations, and then you might want to use, uh, you know, uh, some kind of spatial blocking. The environmental uh, blocking is can be problematic because uh, the because you're not choosing um, uh, uh, because you're not um, partitioning in space. You might have um, partitions that are very very close to each other. And so you might suffer from this spatial autocorrelation problem, this exact problem that you're trying to avoid um, uh, uh, by, by using a spatial block. So you might get points that are very close in space uh, across partitions. And you also might, um, I found when I was doing this, um, I, I ended up with partitions uh, that had, you know, two or three points in them and, and other ones had 100 <laughs> because the environments were not sampled evenly. Um, so that, that's a problem too. Um, but we need to also remember that when we're doing these partitions, each particular model is not supposed to represent our, our final model. Each, each, it, it's basically a test of the model settings, uh, whether or not they can perform well under those conditions. And then, um, you know, there are two techniques to, to arrive at a final model. You can either 
uh, use the settings uh, that, that perform the best during, under cross-validation to build a model with all the data, or you can average, um, uh, you, you can do model averaging of all the um, uh, partitions. Um, I'm in the camp where I think you should use all your data, but um, you know people have different opinions, and 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 I guess both are equally valid, and both uh, 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 you know you can make arguments for either one. Other comments from anyone else? Other I questions? Add, I just want to add the. Uh, it depends on on your question, like very hard on your questions, because if you want to create a like a model of the niche of the species, and we know the niche that we can reconstruct is already biased, like subsetting environmental space may be risky, because even if you do an average of what you what you get with like every three blocks calibration or maximum production of models, uh, it's going to be always incomplete, an incomplete representation of the niche you're trying to reconstruct. So whether uh, in that case, like there's other techniques that subsample better the, the whole environmental, the whole space that the species is using actually. And in that case, that would be better. But if you have like questions like ability of a model to predict something outside the 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 regions of like calibration, that that, that may be useful. I'm not totally sure about that, but it could be. So actually, the the question just above it um, is interesting. If I'm working with several species, do I need to obtain a database for each species and run the script individually? Or can I analyze all of them at the same time? This is about thinning your data. And second question, to process the thin, the, to, to thin the data, can I use a, um, the grid pixel size as a thinning guide? So, I'll, I'll, I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time on this, but I wanted to answer it because these are also things that come up frequently. Um, thinning across multiple species, remember what you're doing in thinning is you're throwing out points. And so you're going you're gonna to reduce your data set over much because in one region, the representative might be one species, and another region, it may be another species. So you really do need to thin each species individually. Now, the other question about, about the degree of thinning, uh, that's that level of thinning, which is to say setting your, your distance filter at the pixel size, most every algorithm does that as a default, which is to say a single record in a pixel uh, could, could, would be the result even if you put in 60 records in a pixel. Okay, that's just the way these uh, presence only or presence background approaches work. Uh, but you can still get over concentrations with thinning at that level, which is to say, if you say every 30 arc seconds, because I'm using 30 arc second pixels, well, that may mean that for an oversampled area, every single pixel in that area has a point in it. Whereas for some other area that's undersampled, it may only be a small percentage. So I think you need to instead look at the overall density of your data and pick a middle uh, filter distance that's probably coarser than your pixel resolution because thinning to pixel resolution doesn't change pretty much anything in the analyses that you're going to do. Can I add a couple things to that? Go for it. Yeah, so uh, I completely agree with you on question one that you should thin each species separately. Um, and at least for 
the SP thin uh, package and the thin algorithm, you could do that pretty easily in R using an apply function. Um, and then the second one, you know, adding to the points you made about the grid uh, thinning, one thing that is often ignored is that a 30 arc second grid area wise is a different size away from the, um, the equator. And, you know, you're talking about, I think up in the northern stretches of the northern hemisphere, say northern New York, you're talking, I think it's 60 to 80 square kilometers for 30 by 30 arc second. And then down at the poles, it's like 110 kilometers squared. At the equator, um, you mean? Yeah, sorry, at the equator. Um, so if you just use uh, thinning by the grid and your grid is based on arc seconds or arc minutes or what have you, then you're actually not sampling equally across your range, which is pretty important. Very, very good point. Welcome, Matt. Um, other questions that somebody wants to, to answer? I have, I have, I see one, 1862. 1862. It's about GBIF data or GBIF-like data. So yeah. I want to thank the professors and doctors for the great talk. Special emphasis this week about data thinning and autocorrelation. It was a comprehensive, a, a comprehensible approach on a harsh topic. My question will be for Jorge Soberon. Considering databases like GBIF don't differentiate source and sink populations, in order to make a study on the distribution of a species in an area, can we try to deduct the different populations, I'm gonna say deduce the different populations from the ecological knowledge we have of the species or is that too much of an interpolation? Interpretation, maybe. Well, I would like to hear other people's opinions on this one, but I think that it, it a little bit depends on the question. Sometimes we are doing very broad uh, explorations of large data sets, and maybe this, uh, including some sink populations, would just add to the to the to the background noise with not much effect on the results. However, if you are ex trying to understand what happens with a specific population or making very specific questions about the distributions of one species or a group of species, um, I think it's very important that you spend, you do your due diligence, you spend the amount of time that is required understanding the data, maybe sometimes even checking field books, if you, if you can do that. At the very least, if you are not an expert, speak with an expert, talk with an expert, and get rid of the noise in the, in the, in the, in the, in the data. GBIF-like data, it's, it's notoriously noisy. You need to do your due diligence, and you need to spend the time um, cleaning the data. Uh, otherwise, <clears throat> you're going to have too much noise in your analysis. So the answer to this question is yes, I think you should spend the time, look at the um, weird data points, either in geographical space or in ecological space, not necessarily are going to be the same. Identify the outliers and then double check on them. And if they don't belong, well, just get rid of the, of, the, of the data point. That's what I do. I would like to hear whether that agrees with other people's practices. So, Jorge, I, I think there are two things going on here. One is cleaning out errors. And I agree with you a thousand percent on that. You you explore, you, you do the due diligence, you look for additional information, and you throw out the records that, that are probably just erroneous. But let's imagine we have a nice clean data set where all the identifications are correct and all of the georeferences are correct. What can we do to assure that our analysis is based on source populations and not 
sink populations, because my view at least of sink populations is that they're going to be in environmentally in environmental space, they're going to be scattered around the periphery or maybe even far away from the true fundamental niche of the species. And in that case, uh, they're going to broaden artificially our niche estimate. I can think of a couple of things, but you know, th this is kind of a, a challenge to our broader group. We could certainly uh, narrow down our occurrence data to you know, pixels where we have records on multiple occasions, right? That might get us away from vagrants and accidental occurrences or temporary populations. Uh, we could certainly reduce by habitat type or by season, right? I mean, remember I'm an ornithologist, so um, I'm always thinking about breeding right. season versus migratory season. So I can think of some 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 help out some helping things like that. But what does everybody feel about about anything else that we can do to amongst perfect data as far as identifications and georeferences? So what else could we do as far as let, throwing let me, out the sink populations? Let me just introduce uh, something I said very briefly, too briefly. Depends on the question. Maybe you are interested in modeling the, the wintering range of a bird species, and that's a perfectly valid question. Okay. So you are modeling sink populations by definition of sink, and that's, that's okay. But if you don't want to do that, if you want to do, for instance, in the bird with, with two, two ranges, uh, one wintering and one uh, breeding bird, uh, um, range, if you want to do the breeding range, you remove the others because those things are not interesting to your question, not only not interesting, they, they, they hinder the proper answering to your question. So it depends a bit on the question, but don't feel bad if, you, if because of your question requires it, you remove data points that are sinks. I, I would do that all the time. I've done that all many times. Um, I'm just asking, how do uh, imagine a species that never moves, non-migratory species? How do you get a better job, do a better job of removing the non-source populations? Yeah, so so I'm a plant ecologist, sort of. Um, so my species don't move. There you go. Um, and I would say, you know, the naive approach which is probably correct for plants at least a lot of the times is if your data set is large enough, then your sink populations are already appropriately underrepresented in your statistical models that you're using. So they're not actually going to drive the um, results of what the niche, what, what you're trying to predict, right? Um, where it becomes problematic is where your data sets are smaller. Um, in that case, you know, Town, you mentioned the idea of, of maybe you filter by habitat or you, you kind of mask by known habitats or known range maps. Um, and those are all good ideas. I know um, Corey Marrow and colleagues have a couple of um, uh, ways to introduce things like range maps into your modeling scheme as providing more information um, to building your model. And that is a way to not do a hard and fast mask where you just throw out the data of things that might be in sync populations, but to um, effectively downweight those data. So that's another, and, and that's useful if you have you know, a reason to believe that what these points that are on the outside are in sinks, but you're not 100% certain. Really quick, uh, you should also be careful, you don't exclude populations that are marginal. So populations that are not sinks, but that represent marginal environments, um, because they look, and they might look like sinks to you. So, so uh, it's important to verify that populations are actually sinks, that they're 
they're, they're, they're not persisting into the future. Otherwise, you're missing extreme environments that maybe some uh, populations of the species are adapted to that would be important for the model. Yeah, and those are also the ones that are really getting you that, that uh, definition of what are the limits of the niche. It's also worth pointing out that source versus sink implies a binary world. But probably the reality is that there are places that would have source populations 100% of the time or you know 90% of the time or 60% of the time or 20% of the time. You know, the, the parsley in my herb garden survived the winter this winter, but the preceding four winters didn't. And you can imagine range fringes being very unstable that way. And so you're able to persist longer or shorter. And somewhere in there is the break point between what we call a source population and what we call a, a sink population. Uh, Daniel, did you have a question that you wanted to answer? Uh, yeah, I have a, I have a few, um, but I think that I can probably group some of them because they are sort of on similar similar topics. Um, let's see. Um, perhaps we could start by going to eighteen eleven. On my way. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, so this is a two-part question, and the second one is the one that uh, uh, was for me. Um, Go for it. So somebody is, is talking about data extraction and getting uh, data for uh, hundreds of species, and uh, to save time, they want to use a script to do that. Uh, and the question is whether they can use um, awk download from RGBIF to do that and, and to have a, a DUI for a citation. And whether they'll have one citation for each species or one for the whole uh, the whole download or the, the whole data set and um, so uh, the answer is yes you can use uh, awk download for this and whether you will have a single doi per citation or one per species depends on how you choose to to do it um, whether you combine um, all, all the taxon keys into one request, which is absolutely possible. Uh, in fact, you can, you can include up to as many as 100,000 taxa in a single request, uh, and that'll give you one DOI to cite. Um, there might be reason why you don't want to have everything in a single download, but that, that'll be up to you. Um, but from the, you know, the point, of, uh, point of citing the data, it's absolutely easier to cite a single DOI than you know, 100,000. So, um, and just to to follow up on on um, another question that was uh, related to uh, RGBIF uh, 1826, um, <clears throat> here's somebody who's try uh, I guess tried to to download some data but ha uh, wasn't successful, um, and I, I I have to be honest that I I can't say exactly what the reason might be, but I have a I have a clue. Um, so uh, in this case, they're trying to download a specific uh, or data for a specific species by the name. And there could be some ambigu ambiguity here that might be the reason why this is not working. Um, and I would probably recommend to try to look up the taxon key to find the right taxon um, before trying to download it. Um, there's a function in RGBIF that allows you to do that as well if you don't want to go to the to the website. <clears throat> there should be a ton of data for this species, but it has been transferred from genus. Uh, ah, from one okay. genus to another relatively recently, right. which is why I thought to jump in. Um, but it looks like it is getting hits. Um, um. <clears throat> uh, looks, looks like there's a problem with the website or the occurrence engine at the moment. That's why you've got the little red dot on the, on the top. Um, <clears throat> oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. 
but you got you got fifteen thousand results yes. there. So the number is there. Yeah. So you know, a, a very general answer is, yeah. If you're if you're specifying that name, you know, be aware that until recently that species was under Thryothorus sinaloa, um, and there there you know. So you you essentially have to be very careful that you're not looking for something that is empty. Uh, in this case, not sure. Uh, just to underline the idea of data citation, um, you know, in this course, I've been wearing my niche modeling hat, but I also have a hat as a curator of a, a bird collection. And I've seen hundreds of papers that have been published in this field of distributional ecology beyond hundreds, probably thousands, that basically just say, we downloaded our data from GBIF. And that completely leaves out the people and institutions that are conserving, creating, improving those data records. Uh, you know, some of my colleagues would say, it's not fair. <laughs> I personally would say uh, it's part of my job. Hmm. But my point is everybody should do due diligence in citing their data. And I would say on a, several levels. Yes, cite GBIF because GBIF or wherever, whatever aggregator you're using they are investing resources and personnel and everything in providing you that data service. And cite the DOI, which at least GBIF provides, the DOI gives replicability, which is to say anybody who, who a year later wants to replicate your data set can do so. But I would say there's a third level, which is Go in and look at the data that you used and extract the names of the institutions. And, you know, this is something I've done for years in the context of the Mexican Atlas of bird distributions. Cite those institutions in your acknowledgements. And I could show you a dozen papers where my acknowledgements section is a page long because I'm citing 60 different museums for contributing the data. It's laborious, but those <laughs> institutions are genuinely working and investing in giving you the, those data. And so I think you need to do the citation on all three levels. Just my opinion. Now I'll take no, I, off my- I agree. I, I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, and I think that in a uh, in a perfect world where we were not you know limited by you know number of number of citations in a paper and stuff like that, then obviously all the institutions who contribute data to to downloads that you make they should be in there as well. Um, but when you know as long as we're not in that world, yeah, we we have to emphasize that the second you know best solution is that if you use that DOI, then yeah. we will make sure that those institutions are credited. Uh, and I, at the same time, you know, we'll, we'll give you, we'll have you a page that will you know, always have the data that you use so anybody else can come back to it and yeah. they can see the institutions where the data came from and they can rerun the same query to see if there's new data available. Point very well taken, yeah. Editors get very upset at the idea of 100 more citations or a page long acknowledgement section. I've always just tried to do it to make the point of how much uh, different institutions are investing in the, in the concept of having 1.4 billion data records out there and available for science. Mm. Okay. Sure, I think uh, you both are perfectly right, but there is a practicality to it. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, it was discussed in the GBIF community for literally for many, many years. And the DOI is um, 
if you are downloading data for one or two or maybe 20 species, maybe it's feasible to quote all the sources because there will be a few dozens perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps less. But if you are downloading, say, the mammals of North America and you are getting two million data points, it's 1,000 institutions. Uh, so DOI is the, is the way around, uh, I, unless you are really working with a, a small enough. And, and I am the first one to defend the right of the providers to be quoted and, 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 and um, well, uh, rewarded at least by, by the citation for their work. I, you don't you know that you don't want to, you don't need to convince me. Uh, right. No, you, you both are completely thing. correct. I, I'm just making the point that we're doing a couple of different things, three things, giving credit to the data aggregator, which provides an immeasurable service, giving credit to the data provider, which also is providing immeasurably important stuff, and also making the study replicable. And so it's a lot of stuff going on in something that we don't emphasize very well. And it's and interesting forgot, because- I forgot to name the, the actual collectors of the data. And, well, and, and that, that's, yeah, that's true. Uh, and it's that's actually something because, we're working on in GBIF to get to that level, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> okay. It, it's an interesting point because um, if you do, any molecular systematics, you have to give the individual accession numbers of every one of those GBIF or those GenBank accessions. Bank. And you know, so GBIF is doing quite a service by providing essentially aggregate references that take you back to the individual. Uh, anyhow, that was a that was a point that sorry, it got us a little bit political. Uh, but I think it's important. So I just wanted to throw it out. Uh, one more question, because it, at 10 o'clock my time, I have to teach another class. So I'm afraid I'm gonna blink off pretty soon. Should, should we discuss um, spatial versus environmental filtering? That came up quite a few times. Welcome to, uh, we, we, we talked about that, I think just before you came on. Oh, okay, sorry. No, 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 no worries. No. Uh, but you're welcome to respond to it because I'd love to hear your perspective as well. It's an important question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky and I'm not sure that there's a, the, a set right answer. Um, with our work, you know, my work with Rob Anderson and colleagues, we had um, focused on spatial thinning because in theory, the bias is from uh, what you do in geographic space in terms of your collecting. And, um, you know, when you, when you filter an environmental space, you're certainly, almost certainly going to make models that fit better for whatever that means. Um, but you are not guaranteed to be addressing the bias that existed in the data originally. Um, and the other thing I would say about that is, Filtering an environmental space in some ways is contingent on this idea that the environmental space, the distribution of your data in environmental space is somewhat unimodal and, um, you know, kind of normally, normally distributed as well or multi-normally distributed. Um, and that's not always the case for a species. And, when you start thinning out, you know, what looks like odd distributions in environmental space, you might actually be cutting out important species biology. Now that said, there are good cases where environmental thinning might make more sense than spatial thinning. So I think you converged on precisely the same answer that we had, but with a, a different perspective, which I liked a lot, which is that the at least some of the biases that that are manifested in our input data are spatial biases. Yes. And right. so doing the subsetting and the thinning in spatial dimensions uh, makes a lot of sense in, in, in respect to that as well. Yeah, more directly addresses the source of the bias. 
any final bits of wisdom, final thoughts? I had one more thing. Go um, for it. And this was a, there was a question was, uh, on, on, this was actually not directly on data citations or, or getting data from GPIF, but it was about putting data into GPIF, which I thought was, was a bit interesting because there, we, we do get a lot of um, questions from individuals that are interested in contributing data to GPIF. And, and uh, as, as often pointed out, we, we don't accept data from individuals, but only um, from institutions. Um, but I wanted to um, just stress the fact that um, you don't have to be, you know, even though you're an institution in a country that's not partic participating in GBIF, you can still request to be endorsed. And if that's not an option, you can find another publisher that's already endorsed and published through them. Or you can even, um, if you have a, a significant data set, you can, you can publish that as a data paper with a journal or publisher who's already registered as a publisher in GPIF and get your data uh, into GPIF that way. So there are, there are many ways of getting data into GPIF, even though you're not in an institution in a country that's participating. So that was just something I wanted to add. Great. Well, thank you everybody. I think this has been a really good discussion. And I'll point out that uh, a huge portion of the feedback that I get about the course is that these sessions are the best part of the course. That does nothing to take away from your presentations, uh, Jamie, Matt, and Daniel, uh, but rather these discussions are, are good because it kind of, it allows us to go back and forth and allows the, the students to hear input from, from different uh, voices. So thanks a lot for tuning in and tune in any Friday, same time. We'd love to have you join us. So no more presentations, right? I, I don't have to do any presentations anymore. <laughs> uh, sorry, Jorge. Uh, presentations, yes, but uh, question and answer, good, okay? Okay, fine. <laughs> okay thanks everybody. Have a good bye. weekend. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Right. Thank you all. <laughs>